backwards. Whoa. Hey, everybody, be quiet and look at the screen because it's up there. So no booing whoever did that. That's not OK. All right, listen. Listen. We have really, we've really upped our game. And like I said, it's cool to make this a competition. And I, I'm going to say something, and maybe some server toss people are going to be upset with me, but I am so happy that we are not in first place because every other house is like making a good amount of money and do, going out and working now. And that is what is important. So whoever comes in first, that's cool. But the fact that we're going out and doing this so that we can, like we, I think from this week to last week, we raised $3,000. So like you guys actually are taking this seriously and wanting to do this. So give yourself a round of applause because that's awesome. And I've been telling a little bit of a story each time about Honduras since we went this summer. It's just cool to connect it and really like get you guys thinking. So we talked about the school where our, some of our meals go to. We talked about the orphanage where some of our meals go to. And then some of our meals go to the community as well. Um, so that's, that's another place that our meals go to. And uh, in the community, last year, if you were here, uh, like a few weeks before we meal packed, there was a huge hurricane that came through. And literally when, Mrs. Barnett and I were like walking in the community and praying for people and like just talking with them. Uh, there were places where the water level, you could see it was like nine feet like high. And so that was how high some of the water was in these places. And some of these people lost a lot of the things that they like had. Um, but they were so grateful that we were praying for them. So grateful for like, like when they heard that our school was bringing meals for them. So like that's another group of people that just um, I want you to know that's in that area. And something that I think is super cool is this little alleyway. Oh, it's gone. There was water and gross stuff in this little alleyway that was on the left side of the screen. And that, that is a public school out there that it was like super flooded. And then they opened up right after that because COVID like hit there a little later. So they weren't even at school. But then the government said, hey, you have three days to open this school. And the Christian school that we support, that we do stuff with, that some of our meals go to, um, they are not only like learning and getting stuff and learning and like getting uh, funds and education and meals and things like that, but they are giving back. So they actually organized a mission trip to this public school. And they went and like cleaned out this public school and are serving this public school. So I thought that, that was just a super cool story and I wanted to share it today. I'm gonna pray and then invite Mr. Turner to come up and I want you to give him a big welcome when he comes up, all right? Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for all the many blessings that uh, you give us, the things that we take for granted sometimes. Uh, thank you so much that we are able to come here and learn about you, that we have uh, most of our needs met on a daily basis, Father, and we just appreciate uh, that you have given us uh, a way to give back, and please be with us as we hear Mr. Turner and what he has to say for us. Uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give it up for Mr. Turner. All right, good morning. If you're in my class, you already know what I'm about to do. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jihad. And good morning. Good, so I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, good to see you guys, everybody looks nice. Teachers, you guys look nice. Casual on top, party on bottom. You guys look nice. Uh, so good to see you guys. Uh, first, thankful for this opportunity. Uh, thankful for God just for allowing me to be able to stand before you guys and preach and teach God's word. 
Uh, thankful for Mr. Barnett for even asking me for this opportunity. Grateful for that. Thankful for the teachers, faculty, and staff that's always been encouraging. And I'm thankful for you guys as well, because a lot of you guys have been encouraging. So, awesome. Really quickly, I'll pray one more time, and then uh, we'll get started. Sound good? So, Dearly Father, we come to you first saying thank you. We thank you again for waking us up. God, we thank you for life and breath. God, we thank you, Lord, just for this time in our day where we could be able to worship you. We thank you for chapel. Lord, we thank you for the privilege. God, there's so many schools, even in our city, in our world, that they can't have chapel. They can't talk about the name of Christ. So, Lord, we just thank you. God, I ask that you would be with me as I teach your word and preach your word. God, would you have me behind the cross? God, I ask that you would be glorified. I ask that you would be lifted up. And God, I pray that you would draw the students to yourself. Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, that's our prayer. Amen. All right. So the screen went off. No worries. Uh, so I'm going to tell you guys who I am really quickly, and then uh, we'll get started. So I grew up in the West End of Louisville, Kentucky, about 25 minutes away in the West End. Grew up in a two-parent household, and I have one twin brother. So came up. Good. So I have a twin brother. Uh, we are fraternal. That means we don't look alike. He's two minutes older than me, 120 seconds. So that's my twin. Uh, so that's my wife. So me and my wife, then that's my parents. Then I go to the next one. So that's my twin. Do we look alike? No, I told you, we're fraternal. It means we don't look alike. Uh, but that's my twin. Uh, that's my best friend. That's him and his wife. So. All right, so that's me. Uh, as you guys know, basketball is my passion. That's my hobby. Uh, that was what I did growing up. Uh, and I got caught up in that. That was my identity. I thought basketball was my purpose in life. However, it was just a platform and a gift, but that's something I'm truly passionate about. So that's me at the free throw line. I'm not sure if I made it or not, but I was at the free throw line. So that's my hobby, passion. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is humility. I want you to say humility. Say it one more time. Humility. Does anybody know what humility is? Just raise your hand if you know what it is. One person. One person, two, okay, good. So that's good. So now we get to talk about it. So humility. So a few things that come to mind when I think about humility, I think about surrenderance. So you notice this gentleman, he's bowing down, he's surrendering. That's what I think about, he's surrendering. But also me being competitive, me being an athlete, when I grew up, I used to think about humility as something that was soft. I used to think, oh, if somebody's being humble, they're being soft. But also I used to, thought, I used to think that if somebody was being humble, they're being weak. Because once again, that's how I grew up playing basketball and sports. Uh, but I think about humility being a servant. So notice this gentleman up top. He's pouring water into a basin, about to wash his feet like Jesus did. So being a servant. But also think about false humility. Now, false humility is something we don't talk about a lot. But when somebody gives somebody a compliment and then they say, oh, no. So for you guys, some of you guys may give each other compliments. But if somebody doesn't take it and somebody's just like, oh, no, no, that's false humility, right? False humility. But then someone being nice. So if you give somebody a compliment, open a door for somebody, I consider that humility as well. So those are a few things that come to mind when I think about humility. So what does the word actually mean? So let's look at a few definitions. So here's the definition of Webster Dictionary. So humility is freedom from pride or arrogance. So that's the definition in the Webster Dictionary. But let's look at the biblical definition of humility. It's to make or bring low one who stoops to the condition of a servant. So like I just uh, mentioned earlier, so someone that is a servant, someone that stoops low in order to serve someone else. But then the Greek word for humility is taponia. Once you say it, taponia, you just learned Greek today. So taponia is a verb. And we know a verb is an action. It's something that you do. So if somebody is walking in humility, it's an action. So now let's think in a broader sense. So let's think about what does the world say humility is? So people in the world think humility is someone that is weak, someone that can't stand up for themselves, someone who is under the control of authority or someone else. So the world does not look at humility as a good thing because humility in the world's eyes, it looks like somebody that's weak, someone that's afraid, someone that can't stand up for themselves, which isn't true, but that's what the world thinks. So let's look at what the Bible talks about humility is. So humility is beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord, he loves those who are humble. God loves to use those who are humble. Have you guys heard of Joseph in the Bible? Yes, Nadia, have you heard of Joseph? 
God used Joseph, right? Joseph humbled himself and God exalted Joseph. God loves to use humble people, right? But also when we think about this, humility is strength under control for the good of others. What does that mean? If somebody is controlling themselves for the good of others, that's humility. So we think about Jesus on the cross. He could have easily got off the cross, right? You agree? He could have easily got off the cross. But he stayed there. He humbled himself for us. So humility is the strength uh, under control for the good of others. But also, God shows grace and favor to those who hum humble themselves. So God shows grace to those who humble themselves. But then Jesus is the perfect example of what humility looks like. And we're going to talk about this uh, today, but this is true humility. When we look at the life of Christ, when we look at how he lived, how he talked, how he walked, we see true humility on full display. So we're going to focus on Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, because I want us to see the humility of Christ. So let's do a quick overview of the book of Philippians. Has anybody read the book of Philippians? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Got a good amount of people. So the book of Philippians is a letter written by Paul. And Paul, when he wrote this letter, was in prison. Now think about this. Paul's in prison, and he's writing a letter. And he wrote four chapters. I want you to put the number four up. He wrote four chapters in prison. If I was Paul, I would have wrote a few letters. And I would say, please get me out of here. But Paul didn't do that. He wrote four chapters. And in these four chapters, he's talking about Christ. He's talking about suffering for Christ. And he's talking about the humility of Christ. So really quickly, we're going to look at chapter 2 today. So chapter 2 in Philippians is all about imitating Christ's humility. Paul is in this prison, and he's writing on his parchment, so he doesn't have a Chromebook, he doesn't have his phone, he's writing on this parchment, and he's talking about having humility in Christ. And he's in prison, and he's talking about having humility in Christ. So really quickly, I want you guys to grab your Bibles. So I want you to grab your Bibles, grab them, grab them, grab your Bibles. Anybody bring your Bible? There we go. Flap it up for her. Um. We're in chapel. You got to bring your Bibles. So we'll do this. I'll read, and then usually at my church, everybody stands up. I'm not going to have you stand up. But after I read, I want you to say amen. Can we do that? All right. I'll read, and then after I'm done, I'll let you guys say amen. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is how the Word of God reads. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. There we go. Thank you, church. No. So, good job. So, listen, guys. So, if you're taking notes, the main idea is this. This is the main idea. As Christians, we are called to live a humble life like Christ. As Christians, we are called to live a humble life like Christ. Now, here are three truths that this text teaches us. So, if you're taking notes, here's the truths. If you want to talk about it over lunch, talk about it when you get home. Here's the three main points, because your parents may ask you. Here's the three main points. So the first one is this. We learn that we see the motivation of Christ in verses 5. So we see the motivation of Christ in verse 5. But then in verses 6 through 8, we see the humi humiliation of Christ found in verses 6 through 8. But then we see the exaltation of Christ found in verses 9 through 11. So really quickly, we're going to go through all these verses. Really quickly. You ready? So you don't have a Bible. It's okay. You can look at the screen. So we're going to look at verse 5. We're going to look at verse 5. It talks about uh, the motivation of Christ. So notice Paul starts off. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when we think about attitudes, we think about the mindset. We think about what somebody thinks about, what somebody does, right? Whatever you do usually comes from your mind. So Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. You guys remember those uh, little wristbands that said WWJD on them? Somebody tell me, what does that mean, WWJD? 
Miss Rumbuck had us up in there. Yeah. What would Jesus do? Hey, there you go. So what would Jesus do? So when we have that wristband on, it helps us to be in the mindset, right? Now, I've had that wristband on before, and I did not think about that when something happened, right? But that wristband helps us to have the attitude of Christ. And when we think about the attitude of Christ, Jesus never sinned. His attitude was perfect to the Father. He never had a lustful thought. He never did anything wrong. He never had a thought that was malicious, right? So for us, we should have the attitude of Christ. We should think like Jesus thinks, right? And this is daily. We should always be having the mindset of Christ. So Paul, he starts off with the motivation of Christ. But then we're going to look at verses 6 through 8 really quickly. So verses 6 through 8 talks about the humiliation of Christ, the humiliation of Christ. Verse 6 says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does that mean? What it simply means that Jesus, before he was in the flesh, he was spirit. And he was with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was spirit before he was flesh. And Jesus came to the earth, 100% God, 100% man. And the Bible talks about how even though he was on the earth, he was still God. Even though he was in heaven, seated with God, he still took on flesh and he was God on the cross. So he was in the form of God as a man. He cried, he slept, he was hungry. He was human, but also he was God. So then verse 7 tells us, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. So in other words, even though he was God, he humbled himself. He took on flesh for us. When he was with God, the Father in heaven, he had everything he wanted. He didn't need anything. But when he was on earth, he needed clothes. He needed food, just like we do. But he humbled himself. He didn't have to do it, but he did out of humility. But then in verse 8, I want you guys to pay attention to verse 8. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, he actually dies on the cross. Physically, he dies on the cross. And the cross is one of the most shameful ways to die. They would place the cross in the city so that everybody could see this person hanging on a tree, and their body would be exposed on the tree. You would see their blood, you would see their organs, and this, it was an example to show how they would humiliate a person. Jesus, fully God, fully man, was hanging on the cross for me and you. That's humility. The same people that nailed him to the cross are the same people that he created in his image. That's humility. But he did it for us. He humbled himself. He could have easily got off the cross. The Bible says he could have called legions of angels, but he didn't. He stayed on the cross for us. You think that takes humility? It takes a lot of humility, right? The same people you created are the same people driving nails and spikes into your hand. That's humility. But let us continue. So looking at verses 9 through 11, we're going to see the exaltation of Christ. So we saw the motivation of Christ. We saw the humiliation of Christ. But then third and finally, we're going to see the exaltation of Christ. So in verse 9, Paul starts off, he says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So after Jesus was crucified, after he rose three days later and ascended to heaven, God exalted him to the highest place, which is at the right hand of the Father. So right now, Jesus is right next to the Father at the right hand. He's in the highest place in heaven. And my old pastor used to say this, there will be no celebrities in heaven except Jesus. Jesus is the only person that's going to be exalted and worshiped in heaven. So going back to verse uh, 9, it talks about how Jesus is exalted and bestowed. His name is higher than every name. I know we have a lot of famous people in the world. I know we have a lot of celebrities. But Jesus' name is the only name that will be worshiped in heaven. And then verse 10, it says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So at the end of time, when everything is done, everybody will bow to the name of Jesus. In heaven, on earth, under the earth, meaning hell, every knee will bow to Jesus. I want you to think about that, because there's a lot of people in this world. There's a lot of people in this world. But it says, at the end of time, every knee will bow to Jesus. 
So what does that mean for us? Either we bow in a posture of humility, or God will force us to bow to him. But God has given us time now to bow to him. So it says every knee will bow. But then in verse 11, it says, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what does that mean that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord? Meaning everybody will give a proclamation with their tongue and they will say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord simply means that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, meaning he's the only ruler that deserves our praise. And every, it means everybody who has a tongue, which is everybody, they will say Jesus is Lord. So even people that didn't believe in Christ on earth, they will eventually say that Jesus is Lord. Even people that didn't think Jesus was real or they thought maybe he was just a good teacher or a prophet, they will say Jesus is Lord. So for us, we should confess that at this moment, that Jesus is Lord. So I want to show you guys a quick picture at the end. So this is Jesus being exalted. So at the end of the day, when everything is said and done, Jesus will be exalted. He will be worshiped in heaven. But for us, as we have time right now, God is calling us to bow our knee to him in a posture of humility because Jesus, he ultimately, he humbled himself for us. But then also the way we respond is by confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. So for you guys, I want you to think about this because I became a Christian in eighth grade and I didn't really understand everything, which was okay. But one thing I did understand that Jesus, he died for me and that Jesus rose for me. And I knew that I needed a savior. So what I did was I repented. I want you guys to say repent. Repent means to turn the other way and go the opposite direction from sin. So as an eighth grader, I understood that I needed to turn away from my sins. I needed a savior. So I bowed my knee to the Lord. It was physically, but also it was spiritually. I gave up my will. I gave up what I wanted to do. I bowed the, my knee to the Lord because I know that he humbled himself for me. And I confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. So for you guys, my prayer, my hope is once you get to think through this, that you think about your own personal relationship with the Lord. Have I bowed my knee to Christ? Have I confessed that Jesus is Lord? And if you have not, I will encourage you to do that. I will encourage you to talk to your pastors at your church. You can talk to me. You can talk to teachers. But this is the most important decision that you will ever make. Bowing your knee to Christ and confessing that Jesus is Lord. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we come to you uh, just saying thank you. God, we thank you again just for who you are. God, we thank you for your word. Uh, God, we thank you, Lord, for the humility of Christ. We thank you that Jesus humbled himself. Fully God, fully man, he, humbles, he humbled himself by uh, death on the cross. But Lord, we thank you that it didn't stop at the crucifixion. We thank you that Jesus rose again with all power in his hand. And Lord, I just pray for these students. I pray that they would bow their knee to you today. And I pray that they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And God, I pray that they would uh, enter a personal relationship with you. God, I pray that you would grow them uh, just more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that you would just be with them as they ponder and think about this. And uh, Lord, we thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give Mr. Turner a huge round of applause. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. So, all right, we have two quick announcements, and then Mr. Miller is going to come up to give us one more announcement. Um, the first one is I know everyone in here probably agrees with me that waffles are way better than pancakes, but waffles, the dog, waffles, the dog is also pretty awesome, and he's a therapy dog, and he's going to be in this. That's Miss Kramer's room number, correct? Yeah. Oh, Ms. Greenwell's room number. Thank you. Uh, so tomorrow, if you want to go play with a puppy, which I'm sure my wife will be doing that. Uh, she's crazy about dogs. Um, bring in an extra dollar when you're bringing in your uh, $2. Uh, and you can go hang out with a puppy during power hour, which is a pretty sweet deal, I think. Uh, the other thing, listen, listen. 
The other thing is we had a video, but if you didn't know, like everything internet wise on this computer is not working. So today we can't show it, but we're going to show it because World Down Syndrome Day on March 21st is coming and we're going to have a huge celebration for all of our Providence kids. And you are able to purchase uh, shirts or socks uh, until February 16th if you want a new shirt or new socks. That's what they look like. And you'll get to wear them on that day and celebrate with our Providence kids and have just a huge celebration. Also, Emma, yesterday was your birthday. Happy late birthday, Emma. All right, Mr. Miller, are you ready? He's got an important announcement. Everybody give Mr. Miller a round of applause to you. Where's our next slide? Okay. We're all in houses, and you're doing competitive things to earn points in houses. Houses are ranked. I think we rank it every weekly, don't we? Do we check our points? Right now, you can earn a pink slip, which in adult world, a pink slip's a bad thing. In your world, a pink slip's a great thing. You earn points for your houses. We tried to talk about what can we do at the end of the year to make this competition a little bit more fun, a little bit more, have some meat, some, some skin in the game to, to win. So we've decided, and now it's not free, it does cost, but we're going to work our best to see what we can do to help. At the end of the year, the winning house, the entire winning house, will have the opportunity to go to Holiday World during the school day. So that means, that means we will be taking approximately 80, 80 students to Holiday World during the school day. We'll leave right early in the morning. We'll get back uh, late afternoon. So we'll get to spend the day in Holiday World. So that's just something fun we're doing with houses. So we hope you pay attention and remember this opportunity. Okay, sixth grader, Caitlin McKinney. We're looking for Caitlin McKinney. Someone's here to pick you up. Okay, Mr. Barnett. I love this picture that Mrs. Uh or Coach Rumbuck made, I did say that it's super inaccurate. Where's, is Miss Patrick in the room? I said you would never get Miss Patrick on a roller coaster. That's the only thing that's wrong about the picture, <laughs> but I love it. Uh, all right, we're going to house uh, our house meeting locations this afternoon. Everybody go to second block. I'll see y'all. 